Welcome to Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther, and Henry VIII. This is Melinda Cole Klein. By the 15th century and the 16th century, the Catholic Church was not only corrupt, but very wealthy, while the majority of the peasantry and thousands of nobles lived in poverty. In England alone, by the 1500s, about 30% of the land in England, Ireland, and Scotland belonged to the church, creating wealth from mostly raising sheep to harvesting their wool to be made into textiles. Surplus money sent out of the country went back to the Vatican. This was a common practice across Europe. Because of the support of printing efforts, European books were in high demand to include religious commentaries and geographical accounts, such as those that in a time would be published documenting the new world for a hungry literary population. The printing press, the publications, and the support to publish by those believing in their words and philosophies altered the course of knowledge from within the cloistered environment of the Catholic Church to a broader access of knowledge available to the nobility, to the common man as a commercially produced set of writings. All the while, reading and book publication led to commercialized knowledge. With the invention of the printing press, theories and concepts became more accessible to those interested in politics, economic practices, and religious ideas, along with social thought. This resulted in debates among Europe's thinking man, from the lowly apprentice to monks and politicians. Martin Luther's attempt to reform the Church of Rome had unforeseen consequences. It split the Catholic Church, led to the death of thousands, elite and the peasantry. Nonetheless, the people who protested against the corrupt practices of the Catholic Church, led by Martin Luther, a former Catholic priest, to form a Christian splinter group of believers known as the Protestants. This social and religious revolution affected politics, the economy, and fundamentally affected the pattern of Western civilization. For the first time in Western civilization, rulers to peasants could read or have read to them the Word of God from the Bible, as Luther promoted its publication in the vernacular. This is languages spoken by Europeans such as French, English, German, and Dutch. In the name of its government and its rulers, the idea was kept alive of English colonies in North America. Advocates of colonial expansion argued that the North American mainland and fishing areas off the coast of Newfoundland and Nova Scotia promised great profits for adventurers. Under Henry VIII and his daughter Queen Elizabeth I, England expanded the economy. Exports since the Middle Ages included textiles, printed books, and furniture by acquiring cheap raw materials from tropical areas around the world, such as wood and cloth dyes. Instead of trading with Spain, advocates of colonization argued that by building English colonies in warmer climes and to have these colonies shipped back to the manufacturing centers in Britain, their goods extracted, this supported economic growth. All the while from the 1400s, British business and political agents brought with them their long hatred of the Spanish and Catholicism in general. Thus, not trading with Spain for tropical goods made good economic 
and political sense. After receiving his PhD in theology, Martin Luther became a German monk and professor in which he found his calling as a reformer of the Catholic Church. In time, his philosophies and teachings inspired the Protestant Reformation and altered the course of Western civilization. Learned men such as priests to those practicing medicine and the law spoke, wrote, and read a common language. This was Latin. But this was not the language of the people, so books such as the Bible could not be understood by nobles to commoners. His translation significantly influenced the King James Bible. This English Bible, originally published in 1611, is still used around the world today among Protestants. So what was it specifically that inspired Martin Luther to become a reformer? Well, first of all, Luther saw the system of indulgences as a form of corruption of the spirit of the church. The selling of indulgences, a piece of paper signed by a priest or important church official, in essence, promised the one paying the money that their dead relative or someone not yet deceased would be able to shorten their time in purgatory. Secondly, you needed to purchase an indulgence for every person in your family or for yourself that you wanted to help avoid this uncomfortable time after death. No, you cannot buy an indulgence from your local priest or bishop today. From what I understand, only the Pope in Rome can offer an indulgence. In regards to Martin Luther and history, four items stand out. Luther preached three sermons against indulgences in 1516 and 1517. This brought him to the attention of the Pope who was furious with his accusations. In efforts to state clearly his reforms in 1517, Luther wrote the 95 Theses disputing the practice of indulgences. The 95 Theses was a list of condemnations of greed and material worth from within the Catholic Church hierarchy, in particular naming individual priests and their deeds. His lectures targeted the Church of Rome as abusing its own people. Because of their fear of purgatory, thousands bought indulgences for decades and decades. Luther believed this was not only wrong, but not the spirit of Christian rituals and their true meaning. Eventually, Luther would be brought up on charges. A trial followed. He was ordered to revoco, which means I recant, but he did not. He believed the church needed reforms, so he left the priesthood. After renouncing the priesthood to pursue a new line of Christian faith, he married a former nun, Katerina von Bora, which reintroduced the practice of clerical marriage within many Christian traditions. The Renaissance witnessed the development of printing, which made an immediate impact on European intellectual life and thought. While printing from hand-carved wooden blocks had been used in China since the 12th century, what was new was printing using movable type and was a gradual process that was perfected between 1445 and 1450 by Johann Gutenberg of Germany. John Calvin was another important figure during the Protestant Reformation. He was a former French priest. He advocated to his followers that reading the Bible is the ultimate word of God, which inspired new sects of Protestants such as the Puritans who adopted into their Christian traditions Calvin's teachings. The pilgrims 
who would be separatists from England, they dedicated themselves and believed in predestination. This religious belief established by Calvin's biblical interpretation accorded that before the birth of a child, his or her salvation had already been decided by God. And under this belief, man attempted to discover if he was one of the chosen that would go to heaven. The first printed European book was Gutenberg's Bible, completed in 1455 or 1456, the first one produced using movable type. But before he could print a single letter, there were other inventions that would make the process possible. Number one was the need for a press. The adaptation for a printing press was to use or model those invented previously to press wine or olive oil. These were screw type presses that had been in use for hundreds of years throughout Europe and Asia. Next, it was the adaptation of block print technology. And thirdly, the development of mass production paper making techniques. Rice paper was brought from China to Italy in the 1100s, but it was thought to be too flimsy for books. Prior to the printing press, European books were made of vellum. This was using calf or lamb skin. They're very durable, and some are found in museums today. In Gutenberg's time, paper began to be processed in mills. Number one, production begins by blending pounded wood and or linen, these are old cloth fibers, together in a vat of boiling water that would form in time a pulpy liquid. Number two, a craftsman then dips a rectangular mold into the liquid and shakes it, fusing the fibers together to form a sheet of paper. Number three, the sheet is then placed on a piece of felt and layered with other sheets until dry. This paper making process produced a durable paper supply in mass quantities which enabled the production of books. The spread of print materials across Europe undermined the power and authority of the Catholic Church, allowing for a vacuum of human knowledge apart from religious study to develop. In Protestant countries in particular, scientists were not persecuted when their theories were shared in print. After all, scientific theories are based on observation and the collection of data, not opinionated interpretations advocated by priests and holy men. When Henry VIII became king in 1509, the court celebrated with dancing and rejoicing. Henry was not the first choice for king, or for that matter, the firstborn. He became king because his brother Arthur had died in 1502. Arthur had left a widow, Catherine of Aragon, of whom, under advisement from his private counselors, he began his reign by marrying his brother's widow. Henry was barely 18 years of age. King Henry VIII differed from his father. His academic studies were limited to astronomy and theology. These were the ones that interested him. By the time he became king, Henry was grounded in theology. He knew much about what he wanted in a Christian religion and understood its connections to political authority and how it could support economic growth. However, England was not, in the 1500s, comparable to the European giants of, say, Spain. To rectify this situation, King Henry spent enormous sums to build a navy. In Henry's 16th century Britain, the Catholic Church had social, judicial, and economic ties 
to the people who lived in each parish town across the realm. The church was responsible for ministering to the masses, teaching of Christian morality and theology. When God's laws were deemed broken by parishioners, the church courts moved into action to administer social justice by reinstating order. This was known as the Inquisition. Priests in England, uh, such as what the practice was across Europe, held ecclesiastical court sessions. When an individual broke church laws, typically a social transgression, such as family issues or something related to marriage, the church courts heard the issues, decided on the proper course of action, and applied the necessary judgment or penalty. Thus, order was restored to the family and the community. Sentences for transgressors were usually light, such as to pay a fine, do penance, or fasting to be observed by witnesses for a period of time. Henry's Tudor government understood existing on a tiny island, land was at a premium, and monasteries wielded widespread power and authority connecting to Rome while turning a profit. Don't forget monasteries were obliged to send monies out of the country back to Rome, a common and accepted practice. As the Protestant Reformation gained attention by rulers, this system of exporting monies to Rome was condemned. In time, the history of events, lines of argument, and the impact of Martin Luther's philosophies and operational opinions made their way to London, to Cambridge University, and to the king's household itself through Anne Boleyn. Through these publications, Henry learned of the popularity that was growing across Europe and to distress Rome and the Catholic Church in regards to rulership and economic growth. On the heels of this religious turmoil sat Henry in England. Here are six points that weighed heavy on his mind. Number one. Luther's writing consistently professed to distrust Rome and its popes. Number two, while his brother's wife had borne him five children, only Princess Mary had survived childhood. Under Salic law, only a male heir could carry on the family name. Number four, by 1527, Catherine was older now and out of childbearing age. Henry desired the young and sweet Anne Boleyn. Marrying Catherine, number five, was seen by many as conditional in becoming king. Perhaps this was an unjust bargain. After Arthur's death, Catherine's mother, Isabel, Queen of Spain, had intervened by asking Pope Julius II to advise Henry to marry her daughter. After all, Arthur and Catherine had only been married for five months. Number six, in his own time, Henry was aware that the current pope would be unwilling to grant him a divorce. But the king saw his marriage as founded on a corrupt bargain, of which now he had no son and heir. It took four years and the creation of new laws to transform the national religion in England. And this put into motion the English Reformation. This set of regulation and legislation resulted in the monarchy becoming the head of the Church of England, known as the Anglican Church. It mandated that all priests and their nuns leave Britain and return to Rome. British citizens under these new laws could not be Catholic but needed to accept the king's church and his priests into their former Catholic parishes. And lastly, church lands were confiscated by the king's government. As mentioned, about 30% of all land in England, Ireland, and Scotland 
became crown land. It would take about a hundred years for these former church lands to be sold to nobles and to those of the up-and-coming gentry class to buy them. Land acquisition was the path to the gentry class through which up-and-coming wealthy merchants in London could improve their status. While they would never be aristocrats or nobility, the growing middle class emulated their social betters. Buying land was the way to accomplish this. King Henry VIII would get his divorce and eventually marry six wives. He would be blessed with a son, Edward VI, born to him by his third wife, Jane Seymour. For the surviving daughters in England reformed, Henry's divorce to Catherine of Aragon and subsequent remarriages declared his children by former wives, living or dead, as illegitimate because the marriages were not recognized by the Anglican Church. The breakdown of succession is as follows. Henry VIII would die January 1547 at 55 years of age. Edward became king in 1547 at the age of nine, but died sadly six years later at 15 years old. Young Edward as a child was never strong. His frail state of health was recognized early in life. The legal issue at hand was the question of succession. Who would rule England? after Henry's death. If Edward died and produced no male heir of his own, what happened then? After much political deliberating, Henry's daughters, Princess Mary and Elizabeth, would rule after Edward in case anything happened to him. In 1544, an act of Parliament put the daughters back in the line of succession after Edward, Prince of Wales, though they were still deemed illegitimate. After the death of her stepbrother, Edward, in 1553, Princess Mary became queen and ruled for five years until her death in 1558. Remembered as Bloody Mary because of her brutal treatment of Puritans, espousing reform to her father's church. From 1558, Princess Elizabeth assumed the throne, never married, and ruled until her death in 1603. With this death, this bought the end to the family of Tudor as the ruling royal house. The line moved through Henry VIII's sister Margaret, who married the King of Scotland, James IV. With the 1603 succession in England, of James I, this began the Stuart family dynasty that would rule Britain until the death of Queen Anne in 1714. King James I was the great-grandson of Henry VIII's sister and the son of Queen Elizabeth Catholic's second cousin, Mary, Queen of Scots. During the Protestant and English Reformations, religious wars were seemingly constant. One such history is the Anglo-Spanish War from 1585 to 1604. During her reign, Queen Elizabeth proved to be an intelligent and skillful queen and up to the manly job as a ruler. A political issue that challenged her right to rule lay in her being illegitimate. In private circles, some supported the ousting of Queen Elizabeth and crowning of her Catholic cousin, the rightful heir, which would return England religiously. Under advisement, Elizabeth had imprisoned her Scottish cousin, Mary Queen of Scots. Had Mary's son brought up as a Protestant, and after 19 years of imprisonment, proceeded with Mary's ultimate execution for treason against England by 1587. Elizabeth's government set into motion a series of events 
that turned into a war with Spain by 1588. While this war was fought over 19 years, the turning point is remembered with the invasion by the Spanish Armada. Spain's king, Philip II, was angered over Elizabeth's taking the life of her Catholic cousin, in this view the rightful British queen. In response, Philip's navy sailed to England to depose Queen Elizabeth. Luckily for the English government and her tiny navy, even though they did have the help of the Dutch, the weather battered the Spanish Armada to such a degree, the ships that did not sink limped back home in humiliation. Keep in mind this was one of those instances in which the weather during the Little Ice Age could be quite severe. In the end, England declared God was on their side, and the war ultimately ended in 1604. This would bring in a new era of exploration and colonization by the British government. What would inspire men to leave England and undertake a long, rough ocean voyage to begin life in a wilderness surrounded by hardship? What would motivate men to risk money to outfit ships and send colonists on such high-risk ventures? To find an answer to these questions, you have to look at the publications of the time. Many men simply sought to increase their wealth by inventing trading companies. English company members shared the expense of furnishing ships with supplies in the hope of profiting from gold, furs, and timber, like the French and Spanish had done before. Younger sons of noble Spanish families were sometimes motivated by the opportunity to acquire estates of their own, for in that time the law of primogenitor required that the eldest son inherit all of his father's lands. Some were looking for adventure and also excitement. In 1585, Richard Hatluck, English geographer, voyage diarist, and investor of trading companies listed these reasons, among others, for the English colonization of America. Number one, glory of God by planting a religion among those infidels. Increase the force of the Christians. Number two, the possibility of enlarging the dominions belonging to the queen most excellent majesty, and consequently of her honor, revenues, and her power by this enterprise. Number three, an ample market to come of the woolens, cloths of England, especially those of the coarsest sort, to the maintenance of the poor that else starve or become burdensome on the realm. Number four, a great possibility of further discoveries of other regions from the north part of the same land by the sea, in hopes of finding a route to Asia. Number five, that our navy not be subject to arrest of ancient enemies, as they would build in strength. Later in 1599, Richard Hatluck published in London the principal navigations. Published accounts include descriptions of Native Americans, products, fishing grounds, and other resources in a way that persuade readers to settle. By 1595, the great storyteller, adventurer, seaman, and politician published his accounts of his Amazonian travels in South America. This, of course, would be Sir Walter Raleigh. Another sound publication arguing by England to colonize North America was published in 1588 by Thomas Harriet, a brief and true report 
of the new found land of Virginia. Like his contemporaries, Harriet was a close associate of Raleigh. Harriet's true report was very popular reading in Europe. It included detailed illustrations. More than an observer, the scholar-mathematician took a scientific approach to contribute to the understanding of the Algonquian natives of the Carolinas. After an absence of four years, John White returned to the English colony of Roanoke, an island off the coast of what is now North Carolina. White, who was to serve as the colony's governor, had sailed there with 117 colonists in May 1587 and late that summer had gone back to England for supplies. The sailing of the Spanish Armada in 1588 prevented White from leaving England as soon as he had planned, and then the need to raise additional money to buy supplies and outfit a ship delayed him further. Not until March 1591 was he able to sail from England for Roanoke. Upon his return, the Roanoke settlers had disappeared and to this day their destiny or demise remains a bit of a mystery. Roanoke, financed mainly by Sir Walter Raleigh, was England's first attempt to start a colony in the New World placing it well behind Spain in claiming land and planting settlements there. It was not until late in the 16th century that England was strong enough to challenge Spanish domination. Under Henry VIII and later his daughter Elizabeth I, England built a strong navy and profited from a thriving merchant economy with money to invest in colonial expansion. There existed desire to expand into foreign markets to sell English goods, especially woolen cloth. Unofficially, Queen Elizabeth encouraged and funded privateers who preyed on Spanish treasure ships sailing in convoys with gold, sugar, and spices from the Americas to Spain. Sea captains like Sir Francis Drake and Sir Walter Raleigh brought tons of gold to England as privateers, a government practice in which Spanish settlements were raided and their gold bullion seized before it could be loaded onto Spanish ships. <laughs>